Okay, so uh, I guess it's time to start. So let me first uh, just say a few words about uh, this course and what it is about. So um, I will be uh, talking about uh, Gaussian fields and uh, probably a lot of you have a mental picture of something like a Brownian motion or some other stochastic process um, and this is not what I'm going to talk about. So uh, there are two main uh, differences. Uh, one is that I'm mostly interested in uh, smooth Gaussian process. So unlike Brownian motion, which is continuous but very non-differentiable, I will be talking about stochastic process where uh, all paths uh, are differentiable. Uh, and second is that I'm mostly interested in, uh, in multi-dimensional versions. So my uh, time will be not one dimensional, but uh, mostly two dimensional or high dimensional. So we have Gaussian uh, functions that are defined not uh, in uh, the real line, but um, uh, somewhere else. So usually, in some domains in R2 or Rn. And uh, another important uh, thing is that uh, we, to some extent, we think about Gaussian fields as geometric objects. So we, so I think that Gaussian field is kind of a random landscape. And we think about it as landscape and ask uh, questions uh, that are a bit more geometrical in nature than most of questions asked in um, stochastic analysis. Uh, some of these questions are similar. So for example, if we ask, say, if you have a Brownian motion on a zero one interval, uh, what is the distribution of its maximum? So this is a, a very natural question from stochastic analysis point of view, and it's also a very natural question from this kind of landscape point of view. But uh, there are some questions that are slightly less natural from stochastic point of view. So for example, if we look at uh, level sets uh, of a field, then how do they look like? Um, okay, so uh, this course will have uh, essentially two parts. Uh, I will start by very brief introduction into general theory of smooth Gaussian fields. <clears throat> so I will explain basically what can we say about the uh, covariant structure of a field when we know that it's smooth. Then if we have, if we know something about covariance, can we show that field is smooth and so on? Uh, and then I will uh, start discussing uh, large scale behavior of uh, level sets. Uh, and there is a range of very interesting uh, conjectures uh, about uh, behavior of level sets uh, and excursion sets, how they are connected to percolation theory and so on. So this will be the second uh, part. So um, uh, are there any questions about the uh, structure of this course? So. Uh, there are uh, reasonably few of us, so if you have uh, any questions uh, at any time, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Uh, I think you all should be able to unmute yourself, or if uh, you want, you can just uh, uh, type something uh, in the chat. Okay, then uh, let's start. So first, let me just maybe start with a couple of uh, motivational examples uh, that are not mathematical in nature, but uh, it's uh, physics. So actually Ga Gaussian fields were uh, used for quite a while in uh, different areas of science to model a lot of natural phenomena. So this is 
an example of a paper from uh, 50s. So this is the aerial photo of um, sea surface and you see these uh, glitters. So uh, this is where kind of sun is reflected in the right direction. So uh, what we have here is kind of a random surface and these bright dots are exactly points where uh, gradient of this uh, surface is pointing in a certain direction. So it's a very easy uh, observable of this field. And so, for example, it means that it's quite easy to, when you have photo like this, it's easy to compute, for example, uh, density of these uh, bright uh, dots. And if you, which gives you density of points where gradient uh, is pointing in a certain direction. And if you have a Gaussian model, I will explain how you can compute things like that. And it means that you can uh, very effectively fit uh, models uh, uh, to your data. Um, another uh, example is uh, this picture. I think uh, you have seen this before. So this is cosmic microwave uh, background radiation. Uh, and uh, to, to large extent, this field is a Gaussian field and it has uh, some uh, Im uh, important implication in cosmology. And now this is uh, another field that um, I really like and we'll uh, discuss this field quite a lot. And uh, to large extent, this picture is my motivation for studying uh, Gaussian fields. So what we have here are two pictures that kind of look the same. It's not immediately clear what does it mean, but when you look at these two pictures, there is obvious similarity. Now, what are we looking at? So first of all, these are two different functions and uh, here, black and white are what we call nodal domains. So say black is where function is uh, positive and white where it's negative or the other way around. And on the left, what we have is, uh, so we look at this domain. So it's a stadium domain. We compute very high energy uh, eigen function of Laplacian and look at it inside some uh, window, some box, uh, which is away from the boundary. And then uh, okay, when you blow it up, you see this left picture. And the right picture is a certain Gaussian field. I will describe it uh, in more details later on, but it's quite clear that uh, these two functions are somewhat similar but left picture is absolutely deterministic and the right picture is random. And what is uh, even more interesting is that left picture, if uh, I replace a stadium by some other domain, and if I change uh, eigenvalue, this picture stays the same. So this is a random field, which is a universal model for high energy uh, eigen functions of Laplacian. Okay, now uh, let's uh, define what are we talking about. So first of all, I, I'll uh, start with uh, something that you all uh, know, just uh, uh, a reminder. So uh, if we work in uh, finitely dimensional, in finite case, so if we have uh, an uh, Rn valued random variable. X and we'll write it as X1, Xn. Then we say that it's Gaussian, that this is a Gaussian vector if for every Y in Rn, this scalar product is Gaussian. So uh, in other words, all linear combinations of X size are Gaussian. So the distribution is jointly Gaussian. And then 
we know that uh, this distribution of this uh, vector is completely determined by its mean. And by covariance uh, matrix, which is, well, maybe. Uh, and uh, then, well, we'll know that it's possible to write explicitly density of this distribution, its characteristic function, and so on. Um, Okay, so now, first of all, uh, uh, to describe this field, we need uh, to know M and covariance structure, and that's enough. And uh, in this course, I usually don't care about M, so I will uh, always assume that uh, M is zero. So in this course, all fields are going to be centered. Uh, Almost everything I'm going to uh, explain is also valid for non-centered fields. It's just uh, a bit more hassle to write everything down. Uh, so I, I'm not going to do this. Okay, so this is a, a finitely dimensional case. And um, of course, uh, we write this uh, as X uh, is normal with I mean M and covariance C. And an important uh, observation, which is very simple, that if we uh, apply certain linear transformation to this Gaussian vector, then the result is also a Gaussian vector. And its uh, law can be written uh, explicitly. And one important uh, corollary of this is that uh, all fields can be thought of as um, uh, linear images of a standard field. So, of course, the easiest field is the field where the covariance kernel is identity matrix. So, our um, coordinates are independent Gaussians. Um, and then uh, any field is uh, a linear transformation of this field. Okay, uh, and uh, another important finitely uh, dimensional uh, result uh, is something uh, which has a lot of different names. Uh, I will call it Gaussian regression. So uh, if we have a Gaussian vector, uh, which has two components, x1 and x2. So this is a Gaussian vector in Rn plus m. So we have n-dimensional component and m-dimensional component. And we have mean, which is m1, m2, and then covariance kernel has a block structure. So C11 is the covariance of X1, C22 is covariance of uh, X2, and C12 are uh, cross covariances. Uh, then uh, if we condition X1, so we, if we look at the law of X1 conditioned on X2, then this is normal. And uh, the mean is going to be M1 plus C1 to C2 to inverse X2 minus M2. Uh, and our covariance will be C11 minus C12, C22 inverse C21. And this is something that uh, we will uh, use quite a few times uh, in this course. 
So, and again, as I mentioned, uh, usually mean value will be zero. So if we condition uh, X1 on X2, then, uh, well, and usually we will condition on X2 being zero, then uh, there is uh, no mean, uh, well, mean value still stays zero and we have some explicit formula for uh, covariance. Okay. Um, well, and this formula, I think uh, a lot of you have seen it. If not, uh, you can prove it either by just simple linear algebra, or you can consider joint densities. There are many ways of doing this. Okay, now uh, what are Gaussian fields? So uh, we start with certain set T. At this moment, we uh, do not need any structure. Later on, uh, we will uh, want T to be a metric space, and usually it will be either a domain in Rn or uh, maybe a smooth manifold with uh, some metric. So T is a set, and then Gaussian field. Uh, is a collection of joint of Gaussian random variables uh, that we denote either a subscript or f of t. So for each point in our space, we have a Gaussian variable so that they are jointly Gaussian so that for every T1, Tn, F of T1, F of Tn is Gaussian. And then of course the, the law of this uh, field is completely determined by uh, mean value function and by covariance kernel okay uh, but with this definition it's uh, not really uh, easy to work with. And because this is just an kind of abstract collection of Gaussians, there is no structure. And I would like to think about Gaussian fields as uh, about functions. So <clears throat> uh, let me uh, give you kind of a toy model, and uh, later on I will explain that this is not actually a toy model, but under certain assumption, all fields look like this. So consider certain collection of functions. Say maybe finite collection, so we have n functions um, defined on our space. Uh, and then we define a function f of t, which is sum of a i by i of t, where a i are i d standard Gaussians. Then first of all, it's uh, if you fix a point t, then uh, what we have is a linear combination of Gaussian random variables so it's Gaussian. So F is a Gaussian field. And of course, it's very easy to check that not only uh, it's Gaussian at every point, but uh, it's jointly Gaussian. And it's completely uh, described by covariance kernel. And uh, it's very easy to write it uh, and it it turns out to be phi i of 
s phi i of t. Uh, so this is kind of uh, our toy model. And in this setting, it's absolutely clear that what we have is a nice function, but this function um, is random. And now the question is how to uh, generalize uh, this uh, construction. Well, uh, one way of thinking about it is this. So let's look at space H, which is span of our functions phi i. And we introduce a scalar product such that uh, phi i form an orthonormal basis. Of course, kind of, uh, if you just say that certain collection of linearly independent vectors is a basis, this, uh, sorry, orthonormal basis, this uniquely uh, determines a scalar product on, uh, uh, on span of uh, phi i. And then you kind of can hope that uh, the same thing will work even if uh, space is not finitely dimensional. But uh, another important uh, comment is that uh, we can identify phi with a collection of coefficients. And this is a standard Gaussian vector in Rn. And in this sense, uh, F is the standard uh, Gaussian vector in H. And to some extent, uh, what we want to do is uh, to extend this construction to uh, infinitely dimensional uh, spaces. Okay, so uh, let's start with a, a certain field. So let K be a covariance kernel of some uh, field F. And our first goal is to construct H such that uh, F will be this uh, standard Gaussian uh, vector in H. So uh, how this works? So, uh, well, first let, let me introduce this notation that Ks of T is just K of S and T. So, I think that S is a parameter and T is my variable. And then we consider span uh, of these functions Ks. So we take these kernels for all points S and take their finite linear combinations. And then we define a scalar product. So if we have two linear combinations and we multiply them, then uh, by definition, so this is definition of the scalar product. Uh, and uh, this is indeed a positive uh, uh, scalar product because uh, our covariance kernel is uh, a positive definite function because it's covariance of, uh, of a process. And then we define H is the completion of this span 
with respect to this scalar product. And now we have some uh, nice uh, Hilbert space. Well, uh, there is a problem. So we started, if we assume, so here are, uh, uh, I assume that my field is F is continuous. And then uh, H, sorry, uh, kernel will be continuous. So when we take span uh, of KS, this is a subset of uh, space of continuous functions. So this is clearly a subspace of space of all continuous functions. But when we take this completion, uh, it's an abstract process, so we get something. Elements of this completion, they don't have to be functions. But there is a canonical way to embed this completion uh, into C. So uh, H can be canonically embedded here. And uh, the way to do it uh, is actually very natural. So let H be an element of our Hilbert space. And then we define function, which I also de denote by H. But now it's a function uh, on T. And just by definition, this is scalar product of H and KT. So this product, of course, is uh, defined. So this is a well-defined object. Now, uh, this is indeed a function. Now, what can we say about this function? Uh, actually, it's uh, quite easy to check that uh, since, uh, so let's uh, look at kt minus ks. Well, uh, this is just KTT plus KSS minus twice KTS, and this goes to zero. Again, because uh, K is continuous. But this means that if you look at HC minus HS, then this is bounded by norm of H times norm of KT minus KS. So this goes to zero. So this proves that H uh, is a continuous function. And uh, always, well, when we discuss uh, this Hilbert space, we, we think about it as a sub, sorry, uh, when I say that it's subspace, it's true in the following sense, that, uh, in kind of linear algebra sense, not the, in Hilbert space sense. So, of course, uh, elements of H, they're continuous functions, but our Hilbert structure <coughs> is completely different. So these two different norms, they are not uh, obviously uh, comparable. So we'll discuss what can be said about um, L infinity norm of these functions. But <clears throat> when I say that H is inside C, I mean just uh, element wise. And this Hilbert space, uh, again, there are a lot of different uh, names for it. And uh, sometimes it's called uh, Cameron Martin. Space. And another important. Excuse me, I have yeah. a small question. Um, so you said that F is continuous, and I understand that it doesn't matter here 
what you precisely mean by this, but uh, do you do you will, will you uh, say that f is continuous if it's like mean square continuous or is no uh, uh, unless yeah uh, we'll uh, we'll discuss this in a bit more details. But when I say continuous, I mean that uh, with probability uh, with probability one f t is a continuous function of t. Thank you. So it's 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 much stronger uh, version of continuity. Well, actually, actually, it all works if it is all too continuous. Uh, you, ju you just need to assume that T is a metric space, some and the process is all too continuous uh, with respect to this distance, and then it all works. Yes, uh, it it just uh, requires a little bit more work and. Uh, in in reality, all fields that I care about, they even uh, so first of all they are defined not on some metric abstract metric spaces. They will be either in R n or on some smooth uh, manifold, and uh, all my functions will be well at least all functions I really care about. They are even real analytic, so uh, I will. Uh, uh, not really discuss kind of uh, in a lot of conditions. I'm not going to present the strongest results because usually kind of if you push it to the limit, it's a bit it becomes a bit harder. And I'm interested in in some sense the simplest case. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, uh, it's uh, enough to assume uh, quite weak notion of. Uh, Continuity and uh, it's uh, all equivalent. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Now, when we have this Hilbert space, what we uh, do is we take uh, so we take uh, any orthonormal basis in H. And then, of course, every vector can be written as well, can be expanded uh, in these bases. Now, uh, it's import important thing. So this converges in H. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, it also Okay, now uh, what can we say about point-wise? So if we look at uh, HT and then we subtract uh, partial sum, so I from one to N, so what can we say about this? Well, uh, <clears throat> this is a beautiful thing about our Hilbert space H. This is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and K is its reproducing kernel. It's just by construction. So what I just presented is a canonical construction that given a kernel, there is a space such that this kernel is uh, its reproducing kernel. And so this is just modulus of H minus this sum times KT. So multiplication by KT is the same as evaluation at point T. And then of course, this is uh, bounded by norm of H minus this sum. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, goes to zero. So this goes to zero as n goes to uh, infinity. And moreover, uh, well, our first factor does not depend on t. And norm of kt is, uh, as we just discussed, so this norm is a continuous function. So this is just kt 
well, square root. So it means that convergence is locally, so convergence is locally uniform. So sum of h phi i phi i of t convergence converges to h of t locally uniformly. Okay, uh, and also, by the way, if we apply the same uh, to H, which is KS, then what we will have is that uh, KS of T, which is, of course, by definition, K of S T, and this is some k s phi i phi i of t, which is, of course, phi i of s phi i of t. And this, again, converges locally and locally uniformly. OK, so uh, this is uh, our kind of so far deterministic uh, construction. And now, uh, what, uh, what about kind of random side of it? Okay, now we call that F is our process, uh, our Gaussian field. And then we look at the following Hilbert space. Now it's currently H. This is uh, span, well, closure of span uh, of Ft. So we have this bench of uh, uh, Gaussian random variables. So this is uh, kind of in L2 in our probability space. So this is a, uh, a subspace of space of Gaussian uh, random variables. And then we have the following map. So, okay, maybe let's let's ignore span for, uh, closure for now. So we we have just span, and then we define a function on finite linear combinations. So if we have uh, a finite linear combination of uh, kernels. So this is what was kind of uh, a foundation for our Hilbert Cameron Martin space. Then this is sum of a i f t i, and so these are kind of these are Gaussian random variables. So uh, now this is kind of a, a different way of thinking about it. And uh, this map is non-preserving. So if we look at uh, at the norm, then uh, it's just, of course, the expectation of sum of a i f of t i sum of a j f of t j. And then uh, what we will get is just sum of a i a j k t i t j, which is just sum of a k t i. So phi is norm preserving. And so we can extend to uh, closures. 
so we get a map from the entire space H to closure of this uh, span. Okay, uh, and now uh, we have the following construction. So if we take an orthonormal basis in H, then we can define uh, a corresponding orthonormal uh, basis in curly H. So define psi I to be just phi of phi I. So now this is an element of curly H. Now, uh, since uh, our map is norm preserving, it also preserves Hilbert structures. So uh, this is uh, orthonormal basis in H. And now if you have random variables in space of Gaussian variables and they uh, are orthonormal, then it means that they are independent standard Gaussians. Okay, so we have this uh, collection of uh, independent uh, Gaussians. And so what we have is that F can be uh, written as some of- Excuse me, why are they Gaussian? Uh... Uh, because, our, well, it's, uh, it's our construction. So our space curly H so uh, is uh, is uh, generated by uh, random variables f of, f of t, and f of t is a Gaussian process. So everything is built on uh, Gaussian random variables. So everything uh, is we, Gaussian. Can't we lose the Gaussianity with uh, the no, limiting actually, process? No, actually, this is a. Uh, an important pro property of Gaussians, uh, uh, you, you can basically prove it uh, by looking at, uh, I know, density uh, of Gaussians that L2 limit of Gaussian random variables is Gaussian. So Ga okay. Gaussian random variables, uh, they form a closed space in L2. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, then we write this expansion. Uh, now, uh, of course, this convergence is an L2. Uh, and then, of course, well, this uh, scalar product is just expectation. Uh, and now by, uh, well, since uh, our map was norm preserving, uh, this expectation is exactly the same as scalar product of phi i and kt in Cameron Martin space which is phi i of t. So what we have is sum of xi i phi i of t. Okay, so now what we have is that our field can be written indeed as this series. Uh, the problem is, well, we have L2 convergence. Uh, well, and this is uh, L2 with respect to our probability. And this is not exactly uh, what we wanted. And now uh, let me uh, mention uh, another kind of very simple observation that this series converges, sorry, diverges 
in our Hilbert space H. Because if you look at partial sum, uh, then this is just sum of uh, xi squared. And now they are independent standard Gaussians. So this diverges. Uh, with uh, probability one. So clearly as a function in Hilbert space, it does not exist. But uh, uh, what is possible to prove, but I'm not going to uh, present this proof that but in, in some sense, it's similar to some arguments that uh, we discussed before that uh, if F is almost surely continuous, then this sum converges locally uniformly with probability one. Okay, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, a good time to have a small five minutes break. Okay, so let's have small break and we'll continue in five minutes.
Okay, so uh, maybe let's start. So, well, this uh, is a rather abstract construction. So let's see how this works in a very simple case. So let's take T to be finite set. Then uh, we, uh, our vector field is just a Gaussian vector, and we have covariance matrix uh, CIJ with elements uh, CIJ and uh, kind of in spirit of previous functional notations, uh, I will sometimes write C i j instead of uh, indices. And now what is our, uh, then of course h, elements of h will be uh, n-dimensional vectors. So what is the uh, Hilbert structure? Uh, so scalar product in our reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So if we have two vectors, uh, then our scalar product will be F I G J C I J uh, inverse. So this is definition and you can easily check that indeed this is uh, a reproducing kernel structure because if we take scalar product of f and c k dot then by definition this is sum over i j f i c k j c i j inverse and then this is just element uh, of product of matrix times its inverse. So it's uh, uh, identity unless k is equal to i. So this is sum of i, f i, Kronecker delta of k and i, and this is just f k. So indeed we have a reproducing kernel structure. And what we just rediscovered is a very simple thing. So uh, it's easy to see that our Hilbert uh, structure is just uh, the following thing. So we So if we take matrix A, which is square root, okay, standard positive square root of C, uh, then our Hilbert structure is the uh, uh, Hilbert structure inherited from standard Rn if we apply A. And remember that uh, our, so, it, this is something I mentioned in the very beginning. So X has the same law as A W where W is a standard Gaussian vector in Rn. So what happened here is that we have Rn and we have here say our standard basis. We have our matrix A and it gives us, so image of this orthonormal basis is some other basis. And H is just a, a Hilbert space such that this basis is the orthonormal basis. So there is kind of nothing uh, really mysterious here. So in some sense, it's an extremely natural uh, construction. And sometimes it's uh, useful to use uh, a slightly uh, different uh, terminology. So 
so um, if we have a Hilbert space, so let H be a real, well, the fact that it's real is not really important, uh, separable Hilbert space. And of course, separability is important then uh, we have, uh, we can define a certain Gaussian process on this space. So this is an H is a normal process. If it is a centered Gaussian process such that covariance, if you take covariance, you evaluate H1, W, H2, then this is H1, H2. Uh, this is also called is the white noise in H. And if you write it formally, although kind of uh, some, well, under certain assumptions, it, it, it's possible to make a sense of it. Uh, so just W is, well, uh, so this, so H is not really function. So our white noise is not really function in H, but let's pretend for a second that it is, then it can be written as sum of A i phi i, where phi i is an orthonormal basis and A i uh, I d standard Gaussians. And indeed, uh, if you formally write it like this, then it's uh, easy to see that our covariance uh, will be the scalar product. So in some sense, a Gaussian field can be identified uh, with is a normal process. Uh, let me uh, give you an example, uh, which is actually a very important example of a Gaussian field, but this is field that uh, is, well, in some sense, it's a very bad field and uh, well, in the sense that it's not smooth. And so I'm not really interested in it, but it's uh, a very important object of study. So let's take H to be H1 of some domain omega. So we look at Sobolev space. And so our, product is just uh, then the corresponding uh, is a normal process is what is called Gaussian free field and its covariance kernel is the Green's function in omega. Uh, but uh, let, let me just briefly mention, so uh, this uh, is 
is not a function. So this field is not a function. So the corresponding series does not converge pointwise. It converges only in the sense of uh, generalized functions. So uh, as an object, this Gaussian free field is not a random function. It's a random distribution. And the main difference is that it has very bad covariance kernel. So of, of course, Gaussian function has a lot of nice properties. And because of this, Gaussian free field has a lot of nice properties. But uh, Green's function blows up when x is equal to y. And because of this, this field is not really a field. Uh, and another example, now this is a, a slightly better example. So let's take t to be, say, interval 0, 1. And then we look at just at standard Brownian motion. Uh, then uh, our space will be space of functions that are absolutely continuous. Uh, and uh, square integral uh, derivative and scalar product, of course, is integral of f prime g prime. And this is an exercise. Uh, prove that. This is a, a reproducing kernel Hilbert uh, space. OK. Now, uh, we want, so in all of these, we started with a process which has some nice property like continuity. Then it's covariance kernel. Um, has some nice properties and we can construct this Hilbert space and write this uh, series representation. But now um, we want to kind of reverse this process. So this is kind of an important question. So given K, uh, what can, well, first of all, if Given k, is there even a field like that? And if there is, what can we say about its properties? So is there f and what are its properties? And the same about uh, h. So first of all, I naively thinking, uh, what can we say about functions from our Hilbert space H? Remember that H is kind of completion of functions uh, that are Ks. So for example, if we assume that K is differentiable, then uh, H is generated by differentiable functions. So you can hold that uh, H is also made of differentiable functions. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really true, but it is almost true. Now, uh, when it comes to existence of F, uh, well, uh, clearly F does exist. So we have uh, Kolmogorov's theorem. Uh, so Kolmogorov's theorem tells us that if we have sequence uh, of measures on cylinder sets uh, with consistency and so on, then uh, there is a measure uh, 
on uh, infinite uh, product. And of course, we can construct uh, finitely dimensional uh, Gaussian distributions. Uh, the problem is that this is abstract construction and it tells us uh, uh, very little about field itself. Okay, but anyway, uh, Kolmogorov's theorem gives us that F exists, but it might have terrible properties as function of T. Uh, in particular, uh, it might be even non-measurable in T. So, uh, now, uh, we will need a stronger version of Kolmogorov's theorem. So this is slightly less well-known uh, version of Kolmogorov's theorem. Uh, I will formulate it uh, uh, when T is uh, n-dimensional uh, cube, but uh, it uh, easily can be generalized to a lot of other settings. So we have a function. Uh, so we have a kernel on n-dimensional cube. K is a positive definite function. And then we assume that it's sufficiently smooth. So there is alpha uh, and C naught such that K X X K Y Y minus two K X Y is bounded by some constant x minus y to 2 alpha, and this is true for all x and y. Then there is unique uh, Gaussian measure. Mu on space of continuous functions on our cube such that covariance sorry, is so uh, this is just slightly different way of uh, thinking about uh, Gaussian process. So instead of Gaussian measure in abstract probability space, I can push it forward to space of functions. So we can think that we have a measure on space of functions. And this is kind of, this is the same as expectation of f of x, f of y is kx y. And so this is uh, more or less standard Kolmogorov's theorem. Uh, what we really need is this. Moreover, if you take any bit which is less than alpha, then measure sits on uh, functions that are beta holder. So our kernel K is alpha holder function of two variables. So uh, then the corresponding field is almost holder alpha continuous. It can be written even uh, slightly more precise so you can uh, write precise gauge function. So it's basically Herder alpha with logarithmic correction. But in particular, it's Herder with any exponent 
uh, less than alpha. So sometimes we will uh, write that F is C alpha minus uh, with probability one. Uh, and as I mentioned, okay, this is uh, uh, stated for cubes, but we can uh, deal with uh, other compacts as well. Okay, uh, any questions about statement? Okay, uh, then uh, let me uh, sketch uh, the proof of this. Uh, so, um, well, uh, we look at the uh, Banach space of continuous functions, uh, and uh, then uh, if we look at its dual, it's made of, uh, so we have C zero one and R, and then we have its dual space made of uh, signed measures, but then of course delta measures are dense there, so it means that point evaluations are dense. Uh, which means that uh, it's what what we just need is a, a Gaussian measure such that point uh, uh, valuations uh, are Gaussians with the right kernel. So need measure well Gaussian measure. New such that for every x finite collection of x i uh, f of x i is Gaussian and we have Uh, the right covariance structure. So it's enough just to look at uh, pointwise things. Okay, now by uh, simple Kolmogorov's theorem, there is a measure which we denote by mu naught like this. Uh, but now this measure lives on another space. It lives on uh, this horrible space of all functions uh, on our cube. And in some sense, uh, uh, we want to show Uh, that uh, if we take a function, so if we sample from this measure mu naught, then we want that if we take a uh, uh, Helder bit uh, norm, then this is finite with probability one. And so our measure actually sits not on uh, kind of this horrible space, but on uh, nice Hilbert functions. Unfortunately, this does not work. The problem is that uh, Hilbert, uh, sorry, Helder norm 
to, to, to compute a Herder norm of a function, you have to evaluate this function everywhere. So you need uncountably many evaluations. So this uh, depends on uncountably many evaluations. So this is not measurable. So So this uh, statement, well, this uh, doesn't even make sense. So we cannot really discuss a uh, statement that uh, uh, Herder norm of uh, X is finite uh, be almost surely because it's not a measurable event. And the problem is that, of course, that sigma algebra in uh, our uh, cylinder space in uh, X is very small. And this is what we have to fix. And how do we fix it? Well, uh, it's kind of a standard fix. So uh, instead of all points, we look at dyadic points and uh, then we'll pass uh, to the limit. So how does it work? Uh, we look at uh, D set of all uh, dyadic points in our cube. Uh, and then we look at this event. So we define the following object. F hat by definition is the limit of F of Y. Y converges to X, Y is dyadic. So omega is set of uh, functions such that these limits exist everywhere. And uh, this uh, limit is Herder continuous. Now, uh, to define this set, we only need to evaluate F at dyadic points. So we are evaluating at countably many points and because of this, this set is measurable. And so we can define the following map. that uh, if F is nice, then uh, we take uh, these uh, limits and the image of our function is F hat and it's zero otherwise. And this uh, map is uh, measurable. And so, uh, Basically, what we want is uh, our measure will be pushed forward of mu naught under this uh, map. And so, uh, but for this to work, what we need is that uh, uh, omega bit uh, has full measure. Okay, uh, how do we do this? Well, uh, let's 
look at this functional. So this is like um, Herder norm of function restricted to D. So we look at supremum of f of x minus f of y x minus y to the power beta, and we take supremum of uh, all distinct points, but now we require that points are in D. So this is like uh, Hilbert, sorry, uh, Helder norm of f restricted to D. And uh, using previous language, uh, our event is just the same as uh, this dyadic uh, norm is finite. And so if we want to show that omega has full measure, uh, sorry, um, the not of omega b is of measure one, this will follow if expectation of this random variable is finite. So if it has finite expectation, then it's finite with uh, probability one, so omega has uh, full measure. So uh, we need this. Uh, how we prove this? Um, well, let's uh, uh, restrict denominator uh, and we look at dm, which is subset of d, so points with uh, coordinates of the form k over 2 to the m. So it's kind of m generation. And then we look at delta m. This is set of pairs uh, such that x and y, they are uh, dyadic with denominator 2 to the m. And distance is exactly 1 over 2 to the m. So it's points that are next to each other on dyadic grid. Uh, important thing is that there are not that many pairs like this. So it's m to, 2 to the m times n. Remember that n is our uh, dimension. Okay, then uh, what we do, we take uh, some uh, alpha prime, which is between beta and alpha. And we uh, look at this random variable. So we take supremum of f of x minus f of y, when x and y are like this. So it kind of controls local growth uh, or local oscillations of our function. Then what can we say about this random variable? So if we look at its certain moment, then first of all, we replace supremum by sum. So it's, it's a horrible estimate. It's very far from being sharp, but uh, uh, it will work. Uh, and then we have expectation of f of x minus f of y to the power p. Uh, and then uh, x, f of x minus f of y is, uh, is a Gaussian random variable, so it's a uh, moment of order p can be expressed in terms of quadratic moments. So uh, up to some constants that we don't care about, 
this is sum of expectation f of x minus f of y squared and everything to the power t over 2. But uh, this expectation of difference squared is uh, can be expressed in terms of our kernel. This is exactly kx x plus ky y minus 2k x y. And the, all of this to the power t over 2. And then uh, how this behaves, well, we, we know that if points are close, our kernel behaves nicely. And uh, we know that this is the number of our terms. So we get 2 to the n m minus alpha m p times some point. I'm ignoring all constants. Uh, well, sorry, there is one constant which I cannot ignore yet. We have this C naught. Uh, let me remind you that it's uh, so it's the constant. Yeah, sorry. It's uh, this constant uh, in uh, Helder uh, uh, norm of the kernel. And now, if we take p large enough, uh, this is bounded by 2 to some kind of bit uh, prime mp. Uh, and then what we uh, are doing well, we just uh, apply uh, Jensen inequality. And if we have an estimate of on P moment, then we get uh, estimate on expectations. So expectation is bounded by some constant uh, and two minus beta prime M. Okay, uh, so now we know that, so we want expectation, this expectation to be finite, uh, we have slightly different thing. Uh, and now we just uh, pass to the limit. Uh, now, if we take, uh, two distinct points, uh, then, uh, choose M, well, there is M naught such that distance is of order two to the minus M naught. So we have two points. And then we can choose like X, N and Y, N that converge to these points uh, along dyadic points. So there is X, N converging to X, Y, N converging to Y, such that X, N and Y, N, they are dyadic. Uh, and then we assume that if k is more than m naught, then uh, x k and x k plus one are vertices of the same. Uh, Dedic cube of size two to the minus k minus one. And in particular, this means so if we have 
say uh, here we have x k and here we have x k plus one, then we can move from one to another using at most n uh, steps of size like that. And we know that when we move by this thing, then we can change function too much. So bottom line is that if we look at f of x minus f of y, this is bounded by f of x m naught minus f of x, sorry, y m naught plus sum from m naught to infinity f of x k minus f of uh, uh, minus f of x k plus one plus sum of f of y k minus f of y k plus one. So we kind of estimate difference between these points by difference between these points and kind of all of these. Uh, and then, of course, uh, first, first, first thing we have some bound and so on. So all of these uh, can be estimated by two uh, n sum k k of f, and we have some well, and this is uh, all of these uh, is uniform. And uh, what we get out of this is that m beta f is bounded by well some constant which is irrelevant, and then we have supremum over all m of two beta m plus sorry it's m plus one, and here we have some So, uh, well, how we can estimate M? Well, we look at, we group uh, all, X, all pairs of X and Y so that they're approximately two to the minus M apart. For each of these, we have an estimate and uh, so all of this behaves like two to the beta k like this. And so when we take expectation, this is bounded by two beta k expectation of this and Uh, and this is summable. And we are done. So this is uh, uh, almost the proof. So I uh, skipped some technicalities, but not that many. So this is uh, essentially how can we prove that uh, if function, if we start with a covariance kernel, which is uh, Helder continuous, uh, then uh, there is a field and with probability one, a sample of this field is also Helder continuous, but with Helder exponent, which is uh, a little bit uh, below uh, Helder exponent for the kernel. Uh, any uh, questions? Okay, then uh, I think that uh, we are out of time. So um, uh, next lecture will be the same time tomorrow. And uh, uh, for next uh, hour, I will be available on this channel. So if you have uh, any questions, uh,
please uh, ask. And if not, then I'll uh, see tomorrow. Uh, hello, thank you. And uh, will you share your notes? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not 100% certain how it will be done technically, but uh, uh, okay, yeah, I, I will share my notes and uh, there will be an announcement. Probably it will be on the same uh, page uh, as uh, the course. Uh, and also, mm -hmm. let uh lectures are recorded and uh, eventually they will be uploaded to youtube again I'm, I'm not quite certain how long will it take but it will happen okay thank you thank you so much thank you for a lecture for a lecture